we're now going to have another panel, um, and I'm going to introduce Melissa Carney, um, who is a co-chair of the State and Local Innovation Initiative. She's a JPAL affiliate, and we've just been uh, delighted to have her both as a part of our network and be a leader in this effort. Um, she is she has provided kind of invaluable academic guidance to our team from the start. So a lot of what happens behind the scenes is that Melissa and our fellow co-chair John Gurian um, really think carefully about kind of the, the academic value behind different evaluations as opportunities come our way, think about how it connects with the broader literature across many different areas and, and just really provide a lot of leadership on that. Um, she has a lot of experience working with policymakers in a variety of contexts and previously also served as the director of the Hamilton Project at Brookings. So please join me in welcoming Melissa, who will then introduce the panel. Great. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. Um, and so I'm delighted to be here. It's always incredibly inspiring to, to meet and hear from all of you who do the hard work on the ground of trying to solve the problems that those, in us, those of us in academia um, sort of read about and try to write about. And so it's, it's always really humbling and inspiring for me to get to engage with folks like you. So thank you for being here. Um, and now I have the privilege of moderating a panel with three um, experienced folks who have worked in this sector of um, building evidence-based capacity and fostering partnerships between researchers and policymakers and government agencies. Um, and the JPAL staff who put together this panel really knew what they were doing because I think we have a great range of perspectives. So to my immediate right, we have Erica Brown, who's the Director of Results Driven Government at the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. And in her current role, Erica identifies and manages philanthropic opportunities for this type of work. Um, and so she has extensive experience working with governments and nonprofits and really promoting <coughs> evidence-based policy making. Um, and then next, and this is the order in which I believe you guys are giving your presentations, um, we have Tracy Kalunga, who is the Innovation Team Director for the City of Long Beach. Um, and under her leadership, the Innovations Team worked closely with the Long Beach Police Department um, to really understand uh, the data and the trends and the patterns and what's going on with criminal justice um, in their area and their jurisdiction. And so she can give us the policymaker perspective on this type of work. And then finally, we have Janie Roundtree, who is the founding executive director of the California Policy Lab at UCLA. So she herds the academics who like to do this kind of research and tries to make sure that they're providing um, helpful and valuable uh, partnerships with the government agencies. And so this will, you know, I think we'll have a really nice opportunity to hear from Janie from sort of the researcher perspective and someone who has worked with the, with the team of researchers and the government agencies. Um, so with that, I'll invite Erica up. Yeah. Yeah? OK, great. Uh, so I actually don't have slides. I'm just going to present from here. Um, the the JPAL team asked uh, all of us to talk a little bit about our experience building partnerships for data-driven policy across sectors. And this is something that uh, the Arnold Foundation thinks a lot about. And, and as a philanthropic organization, we try and figure out how can we facilitate partnerships between different sectors that will enable uh, government at all levels, so federal, state, and local government, to be able to better use data and evidence in the decision-making process. And um, during Marianne's remarks this morning, she mentioned um, kind of three characteristics of the partnership um, between the, the city of Chicago and, and the University of Chicago um, that I think highlight what we really aspire to do with, with governments um, and other partners. So first she talked about how um, the work was motivated by government. So it was something that was being very much driven by the mayor's office in Chicago. It wasn't something that the academic team came in and said, this is a research question that, that we want to answer and, and we want your data and we want to do this. It was something that was very much driven by government. Um, she talked a little bit about technical assistance, so in having partners come in and, and help governments actually do the things that they want to be doing, but potentially don't have the capacity or resources to do on their own. 
And then the third thing she talked about is the kind of institutional relationships. So building something that lasts beyond one individual research project and can, can, can continue well into the future. So I think those three kind of characteristics uh, define what we believe are um, effective partnerships between governments, whether it's a university partner, a nonprofit partner, a private sector sector partner, um, and, and we're always thinking about ways that, that we can help make this a reality. So one uh, initiative at the Arnold Foundation that we're really excited about is our Policy Lab initiative. And um, Policy Labs are essentially local partnerships between state or, or city governments and research institutions. And they're focused on using data and evidence to address real world problems and to help governments continuously improve their programs and services. And our Policy Lab initiative is attempting to, to do kind of three big things. So first, it's attempting to turn the relationship between government and academia really on its head. So again, uh, we talk to a lot of, of governments, we talk to a lot of researchers, um, and the feedback we get from governments is, you know, we've had bad experiences working with academics. They come in, they want our data, they take our data, they disappear, they do a research project, and they bring us findings three years later. That's not helpful to us. We can't use the results. Um, we talk to academics and they say, we actually want our research to be informing policy. You know, we have good intentions. We, we want to do this work. But it's really hard for us to be able to find government partners who need our help, who can benefit from the type of research that we're doing. Um, so what that has resulted in traditionally is just kind of a disconnect between these two entities who have something really valuable to offer one another, but without a kind of systematic way to build relationships and maintain relationships, there's just a lot of, of work that's somewhat ad hoc. So uh, our Policy Lab initiative and, and the work that all of you in this room are doing, that Jay Powell is doing, is really kind of seeking to, to flip that model on its head and to say, how can we establish long-lasting, effective partnerships between governments, academia, the private and the nonprofit sector? The second thing that our Policy Lab initiative uh, is, is attempting to do, and, and Janie will talk a little bit more about this, is really build the infrastructure to enable governments to use data and evidence on an ongoing basis. And, and some of this infrastructure is in, is in things like data, so developing uh, you know, data sharing agreements that can um, outlast just one single research project so that so that each time a government partner wants to uh, partner with an academic to do a research project, they don't have to replicate the process of, of signing a data use agreement. So some of the, the infrastructure is on kind of the data side. Uh, other parts of the in infrastructure is on the capacity side. So having staff and, and having experts who can help governments actually execute projects um, is critical. And then the third kind of part of the in infrastructure is this relationship. So uh, again, Marianne in her remarks talked about how J-PAL spends a lot of time kind of matchmaking, so helping government partners find academics, helping academics find government partners. Um, that's a critical piece as well. Uh, so Janie, in her, in her talk, is going to explain a little bit more about what a policy lab does in practice, but at a high level, um, you know, just, just kind of background, what we're trying to do is really uh, reform the system and in, in the relationships between uh, governments and academia to, to hopefully benefit both parties and lead to improved results. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's Tracy Kalunga, City of Long Beach Innovation Team. It's wonderful to be here with all these super smart people in the room. I shared earlier, sometimes I, um, in this work, I feel a little, or we, f the innovation team feels a little alone. So it's nice to be with like-minded people from all over the country. So I want to share with you uh, what the innovation team in the City of Long Beach has been working on um, over the last year or so. Um, ah, there we go. Um, innovation teams are funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies all over the world, and essentially we're an uh, innovation team placed in either the city, the city manager or mayor's office to really take on these big you know, city problems, if you will. So two years ago, we looked at economic development, and last January, we looked at public safety. We know that's a huge um, definition just to look at public safety, and so we dug deep with our Long Beach Police Department, and our, our focus was to understand the experience of high-frequency offenders that interact frequently with the public safety continuum, 
all these fancy words. And then we have our questions of interest in our research. And these were really the driving questions of how we were going to start to uncover the super utilizers of our city system. So the first order of business is we're looking at um, repeat offenders, and we wanted to understand what types of offenders and who these individuals are. So we analyzed over 100,000 offenses, which represent about 54,000 offenders and 15,000 repeat offenders. Of those 15,000 repeat offenders, they account for 62% of the analyzed offenses over that five-year period. And then our data scientist um, really kind of took a deep dive to understand the, uh, the percentage of the population that what we call our, either our high frequency offenders or repeat offenders, if you will. And so we did a special focus on 5% of the offender population who were booked or cited 11 or more times. We felt like when we got to that number and we started to show this data to the police department, this was a manageable number that we can start to wrap our arms around. That 5% represents about 875 people, and they account for 15% of all offenses. So our theory of change is if we can start developing some interventions around this population, then we'll also see a reduction in crime across the city. Um, we also looked at age, because the police department, and we were very interested, well, what is the age breakdown? And this was actually very surprising to us. We found that there were peaks around the age of 32, and then again around the age of 54. The population was a lot older than we expected. Not to mention that the population is about a third African American, a third Latino, and a third Caucasian. That also took a lot of us by surprise, because we had a misnomer that maybe these were predominantly Latino and African American individuals. Well, um, it's about equally distributed, about 85 percent male and 15 percent female. Um, something our GIS researcher uncovered was the addresses of these individuals. She started to see this repeated theme of the same address popping up over and over. So I said, Christina, why don't you take a deep, why don't you do a quick Google search and figure out these, you know, addresses that keep showing up for these offenders, do a quick Google search. And lo and behold, she found that um, Many of them listed a service provider or a motel as their place of residence. 47%, as you can see, actually were marked transit, trans, excuse me, transient when they were either booked or cited. 41%, we verified, either live in an apartment or a home address in the city. And then again, you can see the other numbers, 8% service providers, which went everything from Catholic Charities, Mental Health America, to even our, our own city's multi-service center. 3% uh, motel, P.O. box, et cetera, and 1% we had missing information. So now we feel like as a city, we're starting to get a better understanding about who these individuals are. We also shared um, this map with our police executive team that 85% of these uh, repeat offenders or high frequency offenders is what we called them during our research phase. And we've involved since then, we now call them justice involved individuals. 85% of them committed misdemeanor offenses, 14% felonies, and 1% infraction. Our deputy chief who oversees the violent crime section almost fell out of his chair because he said, you know, we as a city, we pour a lot of resources into reducing violent crime, which we will continue to do those suppression efforts, but we didn't realize that our top repeat offenders are actually repeating um, offenses that are misdemeanors, if you will. And then, of course, the police were interested in, well, what type of offenses are these? And I call these quality of life crimes. Possession of open container, public consumption, parks and beach loitering, failure to appear. And so quickly, again, you know, as we presented this data to the police team, um, seeing the look on their faces, they started to see the types of bookings and citations um, and the causality. So in addition to the quantitative research, we also did qualitative research. We wanted to take a deep dive and understand um, the types of systems that these individuals interact with. So we did 12 observational site visits to city jail, county jail, the Long Beach Courthouse. Um, we also did ride-alongs with the police quality of life team, our mental health evaluation team, our fire homeless outreach team. We really wanted to understand what are the touch points that happen um, when, we, when we're working with these uh, high-frequency offenders. We also found that there's 12 distinct data landscaping systems in the city. So each, uh, each place that we went, we want to understand, well, how do you capture data for these individuals? And you'll see a slide show in just a, a slide in just a minute showing how there there's these desperate data um, components that happen and they don't communicate or talk to each other. 
We also interviewed 26 offenders themselves. This by far was my favorite part. We did these 90-minute um, in-depth interviews um, for all my social workers in the room. We used the biopsychosocial really kind of as our guide. And we also did in-depth focus groups. This was a way for us to understand not only um, what decisions these people's made to get to their this point in time, but also what could we do to, to create a system that would deter them from returning to, to this lifestyle. And so we had some really rich discussions, as well as we interviewed our subject matter experts, the city prosecutor, the health director, the police chief, others who have been in this field for many years to get their perspective. So we, ha we had over 160 hours of in-depth interviews. We spent 56 hours transcribing notes. And our team, um, really, we took over 200 hours to synthesize, to say what is the data, both the quantitative and qualitative data telling us. There's these six themes. I'm just going to highlight two for the sake of time. Number one, lack of family support. Every single person we interviewed said that um, they either had some type of trauma in their childhood, they were abused, they were neglected, their mom died when they were little, they were raised by a grandma who really didn't want, that, didn't want to raise them, that they grew up in households where they really felt unloved and unwanted. And by the age of 12 or 13 when, is when they turned to the streets or started using drugs or you know, partaking in really unhealthy behaviors. So that was very interesting. As a social worker, it resonated with me, but to have all 26 people share that um, was a huge theme that stood out. Also, this concept of jail and prison, over half of the participants talked about jail and prison as being a place of respite. Three meals a day, you can take a hot shower, it's quiet. And so this was a huge aha moment for the innovation team as well to see that jail is actually a place where you know there you can get some quiet time if you come from a chaotic community or home or you're transient. This is actually a place of respite. And our booking officers um, actually shared stories of individuals who um, don't want to be released because this is a safe place for them in our city jail. So, um, so one of our first orders of business was looking at this data. So as we took, took a deep dive into the data, we realized that our data systems within the city are not effectively communicating with each other. Health, fire, police, city prosecutor. We have a city prosecutor who prosecutes for misdemeanors. So 85% of these individuals come in contact with our prosecutor and development services for our code enforcement. So one of our first orders of business was last spring, we developed a citywide data sharing agreement. This views the city as one single legal entity. Our city attorney helped us draft this uh, agreement up and it is signed by our city manager and it's fully in effect now. And this gives us le legal protection to share data across our city systems. I also failed to mention that our uh, health department, we have our own homeless continuum of care. We have an $8 million grant and we effectively serve the homeless population. And so this allows us to also start to cross-reference data for that transient population. So we're in the process of building a data mart. And essentially what this is, is this is a place where all this data can be dumped. Uh, theoretically, I know that's not very technical, but that's what's going to happen. Um, we're halfway through that process right now, which is very exciting. So we already have police data, we have fire data, we have the prosecutor's data, we're in the process of getting code, and then health, we're working through some of those HIPAA issues right now with our city attorney's office. Um, at what level, yes, we can share names and date of birth, but at what level can we start to um, input that information? And on the back end, we'll be able to type in uh, Jane Doe and see what services she's accessed real time, so then we can start to better coordinate. What we learned through this process is that the fire homeless outreach team maybe have, you know, maybe saw Jane on Tuesday, and then the police quality, oh, that's my timer. Uh, <laughs> but you have more time. Oh, he gave me more time. Okay, um, good. Um, the uh, police quality of life team maybe saw Jane on Thursday and then she showed up to the multi-service center on Friday to actually get serve homeless services. We do not currently have any, a real-time way to connect these city services about who's been intersecting with Jane. And so this is really important for our work to be able to have this real-time information. You know, one thing I also want to mention is that we did a hand count as a quick prototype to figure out how this data mark could work because to, you know, to develop this data mark is a technical thing, but we, after we ran the 875 names and date of birth, we have the administrative regulation, we actually asked each department to do a hand count. 
Health Department, their data revealed that 47% of the population had come in contact with homeless continuum of care. That could have been from just coming in to take a shower or getting mail delivered all the way to full-on case management services. So they're taking a deeper dive to see at what level of services these individuals have received. Fire, fire Department, we met with the fire chief two weeks ago and he is so excited because he sees the the high frequency offenders or repeat offenders of the police department and the trend that's happening with fire EMT response. And there's a overutilization of fire EMT services. He's so excited that he actually asked the I team to take on a new project with him to analyze who are their super utilizers, super utilizers that they take to the hospital most frequently for a separate project. So we're excited that we're seeing our top level leadership understand the importance of this, these analytics, the police department, um, later in the presentation, you're going to hear our, how we've built this, you know, year-long relationship with them. Our city prosecutor has been fully bought in from day one and really sees the value in this data sharing. And then code enforcement found of those who have addresses, 32 have open nuisance and code cases that are, could, that are related to uh, drugs or weapons abatement. And so this is really critical in our work that we are aligning city services and we're becoming more effective in the work that we're doing. Um, with our community residents. So in closing, I want to share with you at a very high level, we've just recently launched the Long Beach Justice Lab at the Mayor Garcia State of the City last month. He announced um, that we're now launching this lab. I'm proud to say that we have, another, we have a half a million dollars from the Arnold Foundation to help fund the development of the data warehouse and, and to implement a multiple disciplinary team. That team essentially is made up of all the city department representatives that I shared who are part of the data warehouse, as well as county probation, county mental health, and state CDCR parole. This is a way for us to triage around to 12 to 15 cases at a time so that we can strategically wrap services around those individuals. The city prosecutor is launching a guides app and this is the application that will have the real time information. So when our first responders are out in the streets and they run a query on John Doe, they can see who saw them on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and do their best to get these folks um, connected to services as opposed to taking them again either to a hospital or to, to jail, but actually getting them connected back to their clinician or whatever services they may need in that moment. We've just recently in our open data portal, I encourage you to take a look at it. Just last week, we opened our Long Beach Police Department interactive mapping tool, which has um, crime incidents. And we're, it's a tool that residents and researchers and others can go in there and start to interact with police department data in an open data portal. Um, we're piloting a clinician in the jail. So for the next six months, the innovation team is uh, prototyping, putting a clinician in the jail. The priority will be for people who are 5150, and then the next will be for those who are on the MDT list. And the third is the other, you know, frequent, uh, frequent visitors of the jail system. And so you'll be hearing more about that in six months about the result from that. We also want to continue to tell the story about our public safety continuum and the great work that our city employees do. We found that many of these employees who are first responders are there because they care deeply for homeless individuals or maybe they were homeless themselves and this is the way they give back. So we'll, we're working on these 30 and 60 second PSAs to tell their story. And last but not least, we've partnered with the Cal State Long Beach Rising Scholars Education Lab. This is a group of students who are ex-felons getting their BA and MA degrees and they want to become mentors and give back to the ex-offenders in our city. And in terms of next steps, we're finalizing our me metrics. We've been rolling out a communications plan so you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook and learn about all the great things coming out of the Justice Lab. We're developing our frameworks to analyze the initiatives. And then by the end of this year, we'll be making recommendations for full implementation. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, th first of all, thank you so much for including the California Policy Lab in this convening. Um, before I talk about what we do in California, I thought I would share just one minute about how I became involved in this work. I am here representing UCLA. We have a new entity called the California Policy Lab that launched actually just about a year ago. And we have a sister site at Berkeley, and my counterpart, the executive director of the Berkeley site, is also here today. So Evan should raise his hand. He's sitting here. I'm representing both of us. Um, but I actually, even though I'm here on behalf of UCLA, I'm not an academic by training. I'm actually uh, more of a local government um, professional. So I spent four years working in the Mike Bloomberg administration in the mayor's office in New York City, 
And then I moved to work in the mayor's office in Chicago for four years before moving to Los Angeles and helping to launch this. So I give that background in part because um, the four years that I spent in Chicago in particular were really transformative in the way that I think about how researchers and government interact. And one of the, the most impactful things that we did during my tenure was partner with trained economists at University of Chicago on a number of randomized control trials particularly around youth interventions that were designed to either increase education outcomes or decrease youth violence. And um, as Erica said, you know, one of the, the goals of policy labs is to break down barriers between, uh, for productive interaction between researchers and government. And my relationship with the University of Chicago just felt completely different. I had this um, amazing world-renowned economist in my office once a month helping me think through these decisions I had to make on a very short timeline. And at one point, I, I, his name is Jens Ludwig, if, if any of you know him. And at one point, I asked him, I was like, why are you spending so much time in my office? You know, don't you have this, this work that you need to do at the, one of the best research universities in the world? And he said, you know, I asked myself one day, what can the University of Chicago do to improve people's lives in Chicago? And in particular, what can we do to reduce violence, um, which was by far the, the most urgent social problem that we were doing with, and the answer for him was not volunteering or doing direct services, which they're not particularly well suited to doing. It was actually thinking about how to leverage this incredible resource of this intellect um, on campus and this really rigorous research design to solve a critical social problem. Um, and I share that anecdote because um, that's exactly why I'm working at UCLA now to try to replicate that kind of model in California um, and why J-PAL exists and, and many others. So. This slide just shows you what our mission is. We improve the lives of Californians by working with government to generate evidence that transforms public policy. And we do that through lasting partnerships between our government partners and our flagship universities. And so Erica talked a little bit about what some of these barriers are. So the policy labs are set up to solve a specific set of problems. Um, and if I know many of you here work in governments, you're gonna recognize this list if you've had, if you tried to work with researchers in the past. Your data is siloed, it doesn't speak to each other. Tracy talked about that. You don't have time. You know, you, you have to make a decision in a matter of 10 days, a week, a month, um, about how to spend potentially millions of dollars. You can't wait around for some academic to tell you, you know, two years later how to spend your money. Um, there are changes in leadership. You could have an incredible department head who invests a lot of time in a program and then suddenly they, they leave and move on with their career and the whole strategy changes for social service delivery. Um, you, I already talked about making decisions quickly. A lot of times there's just a lack of funding and resources. Even if you want to build your own internal capacity to analyze data, no one's funding that. You don't have the money available to you in the government. Um, and occasionally, maybe not as often as people assume, there are real political pressures to either not examine something that's working or invest in something that you feel like might not be working as well as it should. There are also significant barriers within academia. I think a lot of researchers want to be doing this work or think that they're doing this work and it isn't actually having the impact that they hope. And so this list really speaks to what's happening on campus. Research often just takes way too long to, be, to have an immediate impact on government decision making. Um, often the questions are not aligned. So a question that's academically interesting that moves the field forward doesn't really speak to the, the urgent decisions that the government has to make. Um, we are, many people have mentioned lack of access to data. It can be very difficult and time consuming to sign data sharing agreements and overcome privacy concerns to get access to the data you need to really study a problem. Um, I, I have found in my experience that a lot of academics don't understand the, the government operations and policies to the extent that they need to in order to actually have an insight that's useful. If you look at administrative data, I'll just take a homeless management information system for example. Um, you're looking at administrative data and you can easily make mistakes in drawing conclusions if you don't have the history of all of the policies that went into to that data. So what, how does the California Policy Lab or policy labs like ours, like the DC lab that presented earlier today, how are we solving these problems? I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do, who we are, who our partners are in California, um, and a little bit about our current projects. So our model is that we go deep and long with specific partners. So we at UCLA work with the city and the county of Los Angeles with our homeless services um, uh, authority, several people who I believe are here today from, from LASA. 
Um, we sit down with a partner and we ask them, what are your questions? And often they're not framed as research questions and there's a process of translating them into research questions. We then sign data sharing agreements. Erica um, mentioned this, but we don't sign project-based agreements. We sign modular agreements. So we sign, we negotiate all of the terms, the privacy and disclosure and IP, and then we attach appendices for new projects. So it could take nine to 12 months to sign that first agreement, and then all of the additional ones can take days, in some cases, or weeks, uh, which really cuts down the time. We then analyze the data, and then we often are, the long-term goal is to do more scientific research or program evaluation with our partners. We don't have unlimited capacities. We really have to focus on where our faculty have subject matter expertise. So in California, we're focused on homelessness and high-needs populations or super utilizers, criminal justice and public safety, we have a portfolio on education, social safety net, and labor and employment. So we, there are several entities here in the room today that work on government um, partnerships or evidence-based policy, and policy labs have a, Q, a few features that are unique. Um, one is that we are tapping into tenured faculty at our research, so we're not only trying to build the internal capacity of government, we're also trying to leverage people who frankly would not work in government, but who have a lot to offer um, our partners. We stick around for years, so we might work on a project, but we're not going to walk away at the end of the project. We're going to continuously have a cycle of learning. Um, we also link and house data internally at UCLA on behalf of our UCLA and Berkeley staff so that we can support multiple projects for multiple agencies. That's part of our legal infrastructure. Um, and then one key feature of Policy Labs is that the executive director or some leadership in the lab, like myself and Evan, are actually not researchers. We, are, we have extensive experience in executive management and government. When we sit in these meetings, we hear what they are saying very differently than a researcher would. So there's a really important translation function. And then we try to be flexible about the research methodologies that we use. Some problems just require a different type of solution. So who are we? We talked a little bit about our faculty directors. This is Till Von Wachter and Jesse Rothstein, who are both trained economists who lead the lab. We also have a range of faculty affiliates, I think at least um, 15 at this point, who are working on different projects. I talked about the role that Evan and I play. We also invest in full-time staff who do the data analysis and the project management, and that's in part because we don't want graduate students to invest a huge amount of time becoming experts in data and in our partners and the only to walk away and move on with their career. So we do work with graduate students. They're often very valuable, but we also have full-time staffs, which reduces the burden on our government partners because it takes a lot of their time as well to get our researchers up to speed. And then we also have, um, as Erica mentioned briefly, a legal IT and administrative function that's a little bit unusual for a campus operation. We have our own full-time IT manager. This is incredibly important when you're handling the amount of data that we are. We also have a full-time lawyer that we're currently hiring whose sole role is to manage all of these privacy um, and legal arrangements that are critical to this type of research. And then we have an administrative function that really just reduces the barrier for researchers in doing their work. This is just a snapshot of some of our current partners in California. We work with the LAPD, the San Francisco PD, and the Oakland PD. We're working with several different prosecutors' offices. We work with the Los Angeles-based Homeless Initiative, which is a number of different stakeholders working on a coordinated plan. We work with homeless service authorities, at least three different state agencies, including CDSS, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, um, and the California Employment Development Department, um, and we have other partners as well. This is just a snapshot of our values, so how we do our work is just as important as what we're doing. We try to be scientifically rigorous. We try to be stewards of the public good. We're not doing this to develop models and then sell them, for example. Um, we're committed to continuous improvement, and of course we want to be kind, respectful, and collaborative. I often find myself referring work to our local research institutions in Los Angeles because our mission is to improve the public good and not necessarily to generate business for our universities. So I'll just end quickly um, with a few examples of the work that we're currently doing. We've only been around for about a year, so we don't have uh, results from RCTs, for example, although we hope to have that um, in the coming years. But we have done quite a bit of work in our first year. This was one of our first publications. We were evaluating a state-level intervention to improve um, interdiction of contraband in prisons. 
and the government spent $10 million over two years intensifying their effort to interdict contraband, including illegal drugs and cell phones within the prison system. And we had uh, 11 treatment sites and a range of control sites. Um, and interestingly, we found very little effect from this relatively expensive program. The um, actual results are on our website if you're curious about this particular subject. But the impact was really the governor rethinking investing this in the, in the future. So sometimes the impact you have is to slow down an investment that is underperforming. We do a lot of rapid response data analysis, which is a little bit different. Usually your research universities are really focused on work that has publication value. A lot of this never leads to publication, and in some cases we do it confidentially um, at the request of an agency if it's a particularly sensitive issue. But just to give you an example, uh, we had a student support Tracy actually in the work that she described for Long Beach and their frequent utilizers. We did a similar project for a Bay Area law enforcement agency looking at their frequent utilizers. Um, we're, we're looking at shelter utilization rates for a homeless services authority. And for a major law enforcement agency, we're doing an extended analysis of police pursuits and their outcomes. So looking at why they're pursuing, when they're pursuing, whether they're arresting as a result, whether innocent bystanders are being, are being injured. And then this is a topic that I, I know is um, a central focus for tomorrow, so I'll talk a little bit about this, but for Los Angeles County, we're doing two different data science projects. One is looking at four years worth of service utilization to try to predict in 2015 how many people would become homeless for the first time. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at four million people served by the County of LA over four years and trying to predict roughly 44,000 who would become homeless. Um, we built a proof of concept model over the summer and were able to accurately predict 86% of these individuals. So the LA County has approved us moving forward with the project and we'll be refining the model and operationalizing it. We used the same data to actually predict persistent high cost utilization, which came up at least at our table this morning. Um, a lot of times uh, an entity will look at high cost utilizers in any given year and just take the top percentage. But what we know is that 90% of those individuals in LA County at least will no longer be high utilizers two years later. So we're building a machine learning model to try to predict who will not only be one, a high utilizer in one year, but persistently high cost utilizer over a period of years. And then finally, this is just an example of how sometimes we need to be flexible. We're working with the city of Los Angeles on enrollment in parks programs, and the goal is to try to boost uh, enrollment among low income communities and particularly to increase gender equity. And it was an RCT, but we knew from the very beginning it would be underpowered. So we combined it with a qualitative research project to make sure that they got information about um, how to improve enrollment. So I'll just leave it there. I'm happy to answer any questions people have about our work. And that's our website. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of you. Um, I'm going to ask a couple questions of the panelists, and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A. So one thing that uh, strikes me as I listen to all three of you is that um, you've all been very successful at fostering these partnerships. Um, you know, Tracy, listening to yours, it sounds like everyone in Long Beach loves data and loves transparency, <laughs> right? And like wants more. And I have to think that um, that actually didn't just magically happen. A lot of work went into getting to that place. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts from all three of you about, in your experience, what has been you know, one or two of the biggest hurdles to launching these successful partnerships? And um, you know, in some cases, maybe you weren't able to overcome them, but in the, in the instances where you were, sort of what did it take? You want, to go, you want to start since like sure. all the stars seem to be aligned to where sure. you are? You know, it's funny when we talk about the work that we're doing in Long Beach, just to give a little history, I've worked for the city for 12 years and my previous position for five years, I was in charge of our city's safe Long Beach violence prevention plan and our My Brother's Keeper um, local action plan. And so um, when I started that work about seven years ago, the city prosecutor, actually a lot of these partners were on the table like, 
what is a violence prevention plan and what do you propose to do, right? So when I said the city prosecutor was fully on board, that's because I spent five years with a very Republican city prosecutor telling me why these interventions shouldn't work. And I was willing to sit, you know, over dinner or lunches, you know, we end up at the same fundraising events all the time, um, really talking through and building a relationship. And um, a lot of what you hear when you hear, you know, that people are now believers, it's because it's taken time. The fire chief, when we st first started the project around the super utilizers, he was the guy with his arms crossed. Like, what are you gonna really teach us, Tracy? And here he is a year later, and he's a believer. And so, um, please know that, you know, this has been a process. The chief of police and I came up through the ranks together. I've known him for 12 years. Back when he was a beat cop, he would stop by the park where I worked. Um, I ran a health facility for the, the health department 12 years ago. And so a lot of these relationships have really been built off of trust and years of like, let's try new things together. I used to run our uh, city's Department of Justice Weed and Seed Grants, who remembers Weed and Seed from back in the day, um, which is a crime prevention grant. And so please know um, that you know this work really, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of trust building. And it was funny because when Janie was standing up there, I realized that she and I are translators. Right, so we have all these, we have this research and academic background. I teach part-time at Cal State Long Beach. I'm very invested in the research community, but when I sit with the chief and the executive team, they're law enforcement. They're trained to be police officers. So when I talk about data analytics and algorithms, they like literally, they're like, what are you talking about? Their eyes go blank. And so what I've learned to do is use very common language to explain what we're doing and to take our time in sharing data and information in a really digestible, uh, user-friendly way. If you want to add or? Sure, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think if, if one theory about how to advance evidence-based policy making is to access data and particularly to link data, one of the biggest challenges is uh, overcome people's innate nervousness about that. You know, it could be a legal problem or a privacy problem or I just don't even know how you're going to do it problem. Um, and the faster you can demonstrate something very concrete and very valuable to your partners, the more buy-in you'll have. And often if you can get past that first hurdle, you can really speed the train along pretty quickly. I had that experience in New York, Chicago, and in LA. You just need to have land on something you can do relatively quickly that demonstrates that you care about what this data owner is trying to do and um, do it relatively quickly. And it really has a, a huge impact, I think, on people's buy-in. I'll just echo that. I mean, I think in, in our experience trying to launch policy labs like the California Policy Lab and, and the lab at DC, this is really a long game and it takes a lot of time. So finding a balance between what can labs be offering to government partners in the short term to keep them engaged and to get them bought in so that they do trust this entity to continue to be a partner in the future has been really challenging, but when done well has, has really set labs up for success. Um, all right, so I'm also going to take my moderator's prerogative as an academic here to say that, like, you know, there, you mentioned, I think, Janie, it was on your slide, like, academics do have different timelines, and it's not just that we're slow, but, like, we do have to <laughs> write papers yeah. that we can publish in academic journals, right? That's, yeah. like, what we get paid ostensibly to do. Um, and that doesn't always fit with what policymakers need. And it's also the case, as you mentioned, like it takes a lot of upfront investment, right? So like, George is here, he's gotta write a dissertation, folks, in the next four years. So Danielle, chop, chop with the HUD funding, <laughs> right? Like, so there's, there's real time pressures. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious as to how you guys have thread this needle and made it work, such that like you have 15 faculty members who are working on these projects, right? And clearly you're producing something of value to the policymakers at the same time. And, and of course, this is what you all have been facilitating. So I'm, I'm eager to hear how you've, um, how you've sort of bridged those divides. Yeah, so I can start, um, and Erica should talk about this too. I was in a recent conversation with about 20 different researchers in LA of, and a number of different universities who were trying to work on homelessness on behalf of the county. And one of them said that the biggest barrier for her is the rigid federal funding. So if you get if you rely on NIJ or NIH or um, big DOE grants, you don't have the flexibility to spend time um, really digging into a problem. I wanted to say that because I don't want to 
uh, I don't want to minimize the role that the Arnold Foundation has had in this because what they're really doing is investing in people who want to do this work and giving them the flexibility to do it. And they're now changing the way that other philanthropists are thinking about this. Um, it's Smith Richardson and other, other foundations, and it's hugely important in solving the problem that you're identifying. We also work with tenured faculty who really care about the mission um, so they self-select into our model um, and often are just interested in solving homelessness or poverty or thinking about economic mobility and they have the luxury to spend a little bit more time, frankly, on the front end. Um, I think also, realistically, um, this is not all dis self-disinterested. There are opportunities for hugely impactful academic research in the long run, um, especially because administrative data is so under-accessed and underutilized. So I think a lot of our faculty um, are in it for different reasons, and they're, they each have their own, you know, place on that spectrum. But there is a lot of really important academic work to be done at the same time that's also useful. So I think it's a combination of of those things. Can I just ask you one follow-up question? Because you mentioned sometimes you'll have a project and you'll give it to one of the local like research shops. Um, so maybe for some of the folks in the room who are sort of new to getting in this game of partnering with academics, um, in your experience, sort of what's the difference? from going to one of those shops that is used to doing evaluations for the state versus going to one of the academics at your local university? Yeah, that's a great question. Just to clarify my point, um, the, the policy labs tend to have economists as faculty members, and they think about program evaluation in a very specific way, and a lot of what we do is quantitative. Um, there are questions we get that are very obviously better suited to qualitative research, so I often will refer a project, I, just two weeks ago I referred a project to USC Social Work because they have the capacity and the expertise to do something that we just could never do. So that was more what I was referring That's to and I think trying to be collaborative and create a culture of learning around a really urgent social problem is important um, and it makes it more likely that they would refer work to UCLA. You're catching the USC UCLA yeah. <laughs> rivalry here, this is like a real thing here. Um, it's, it's maybe a bigger deal than it sounds. <laughs> But I, I think your, your question is um, uh, a really important one, which is sort of, for, as a government person, if I think back to myself eight years ago before I really knew much about academics, I did not understand the difference between a pre-post evaluation I would get from a research shop mm -hmm. and what I would get from the partners that I eventually had, just for example, at University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until we started doing RCTs together that I, that I understood and, and what um, captain, is it captain? Commander, I'm sorry, excuse me, <laughs> Commander Ennis said, um, uh, I had the exact same experience. You know, I, I, I got religion and understood it and then passed that information on to other people that I was working with. Um, and, and CPL, actually, Evan did a, a great training for people um, around program evaluation and explaining the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think it just takes some investment in that level of education and people really seeing the impact. So I don't, yeah. you probably think about that too. It's a, it's a really good and, and difficult question, Melissa. I mean, so for labs that we have started, we've kind of taken the easy way out and we are just, labs are, are led by tenured faculty. It's really difficult. I've, I've had conversations with tenured faculty where I know there's a junior faculty that I would want to engage in the lab more and, and, the, and the senior faculty will say, I have to be on the call because I can't allow you to like convince the junior faculty to spend their time yeah. doing a lot of this work. We need them to get tenure. So it's a really difficult um, question, and the Arnold Foundation doesn't have a strategy on how to transform academia and higher ed, <laughs> but we're trying to do some of this through through the, the, the policy lab structure and a lot of you know what, what Janie said has come into play. I think some of this will is, is probably better suited to an audience outside of this room because I think all of the academics who are sitting in this room right now are the type of people who are already doing this type of work. Yeah. Um, but, but one challenge is how do we kind of, how can academia train the next generation of researchers mm -hmm. to be inclined to do this work? And how can we have universities incentivize and value this? I would, I would just add quickly, I, th I think one thing that we've seen in this last year there are opportunities to do very rigorous randomized assignment, for example, but there's a lot of resistance to that, particularly yeah. in social services. And there's also resistance to how much time it would take and, and coming in and not presenting it as an either or is really important. Yeah. Having a strategy to get information to the government partner quickly through any means while also convincing them to invest in a longer term evaluation strategy can be really helpful. So you're not just leaving them hanging. You, know, you can either do this two year really difficult thing with me 
or you know, or nothing. You know. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Can I, do you mind if I just add? Please. Um, so a shameless plug, the city of Long Beach has a proposal into the Arnold Foundation to do an RCT in partnership <laughs> <laughs> with the California Policy Lab. Um, so our fingers are crossed. If Linda can ask for points, if Linda Gibbs can ask for points, then I'm gonna, we're going to ask for points. Here, so. Um, no, seriously, though, it was so cool because when we met, well, first of all, I met Janie. I'm a UCLA Luskin grad. So when our mayor's office said, hey, can you meet with Janie Roundtree from the UCLA Luskin school? I was like, when are we going? You know, let's do this. And so we met and I was so intrigued by the work she did in New York and Chicago. And just I really actually look up to her as a mentor because she was in this field for so many years. So when I tell her about some of the hiccups or bureaucratic challenges I have, she understands because she's been there. Um, so when we started exploring this concept of an RCT, um, you know, she has some great faculty she, that she works with, and I said for the data for the Data Mart Data Warehouse, this RCT um, will come into play really well. However, what if we partnered with Cal State Long Beach School of Social Work to help evaluate the component of the multiple disciplinary team? Because we base that off the wraparound model and the fact, you know, the fact program. And she was so open and supportive. Um, you know, again, I'm a UCLA grad. I teach at Cal State Long Beach. I'm trying to figure out how to marry the two. And a lot of time, the academic institutions in Southern California try to compete for which city, you know, they want to try to one up each other. And to actually have this person from UCLA say, yes, let's bring on Cal State Long Beach and figure out how we can make this work. And so our proposal that we've put together for the RCT includes Cal State Long Beach School of Social Work and the California Policy Lab. Kudos to you. <laughs> you said yes. You could have told me no. Okay, one more and I'll yield the mic. Tracy, I had a question that came out of listening. I, I, I thought it was really interesting. The stuff you were presenting um, was really about sort of population demographics of who you were serving and, and, and sort of how illuminating that was to the police and fire um, chief officers. Um, and that's very different from the RCTs that we were talking about this morning. And it... You know, I think it raises like an existential question for all of us, which is what is evidence-based policy making, right? And so, and this must be something that you all think about at the foundation, like what are the markers and when is it a successful collaboration? Um, like how far do you have to go? Okay. Um, you know, I'll say that in terms of the intervention, we just started. Literally January, we, you know, we considered January 1st, that's our start date. We're launching the Justice Lab. And so it's really going to be at least two years down the road before we can say what is the outcome of the work that we've done together. And then I, you know, fingers crossed that we get this RCT. I think that's really going to elevate our ability um, to evalu- effectively evaluate the work that we've been doing. But just, you know, preliminarily getting all of these city departments, county departments, and state parole at the table, I consider that a win. It may not be an evidence-based, you know, in terms of um, some analytic behind it, but that's a, that's a culture shift that's happening, that you have all these government partners at the table who are saying, yes, we're willing to work together. How can we data share across city, county, and now the states? Because that's going to be, now that we have the city data sharing agreement, now we're going to have to work on developing one with the county. And so, um, you know, hopefully I've answered your question, but I yeah. really view this work as a marathon and not a sprint. And so there's small wins, and when we get them, like the fire chief asking us to analyze the super utilizers, like we were jumping after that meeting, like, yes, that's a win, because that means we're about to engage at a much deeper level with the fire department and the local hospitals. Um, again, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So we have to be dedicated to this work for, you know, the years ahead to really start to see the results. Yeah, I think this, this question of how do you, how do you define evidence-based policy and, and how do we know what evidence-based policy is and if it's making a difference. You know, at, at the foundation, our, our kind of ultimate goal is to improve people's lives. So in order for evidence-based policy to do that, not only do you have to do the hard work of investing in data and program evaluation, once a program evaluation is completed, I think then that's when the really hard work starts of how do you take those results and actually use them to inform policy, use them to inform program design and implementation. Um, that is complicated for many reasons, you know, not only because those decisions are being made in a political process, there's a budgetary cycle that, it, you know, if the results aren't available at the right time, this, this doesn't work out. So one of our big questions is, um, you know, how do we know if this is working well? We have to, we haven't quite had enough time to see concrete examples of 
when program evaluations happen and then what is the policy implication? Did a, did a change happen in decision making? That's something that we're actively following and, and trying to figure out. Um, and, and how do we know whether things like policy labs are actually leading to actual improvements in people's lives is something that is incredibly difficult to evaluate, um, but something that we have to continue to challenge ourselves to, to measure in the best way that we can. Great. Any? Yeah, right here. Oh, okay. We can start in the back where the mic is and then come up. <laughs> um, my question is just um, looking at your website and the services that you offer. Uh, it's around sort of how modular that package of services might be. And what I mean by that is um, if in, I'm in an organization where we do have plenty of internal capacity, scientific capacity, what we don't have is the special ability to get the data use agreements and sharing um, and all of that that the universities ha are magically slightly more magically able to accomplish. <laughs> and we've talked about this, Evan, a little bit. Um, and so my question is, can, the, can Cal Policy Lab simply serve that function? So in other words, can in, in a cross-system intervention, which everything is these days, can you go around and get the data use agreements and get all the data and link it together for us and then let us analyze it? <laughs> can we? I don't know. No, <laughs> um, no I, I think that's actually a fantastic question. So um, one year in, we serve that function for our partners. And so uh, one really critical principle to data sharing is that we follow the lead of the data owner and what the data owner is trying to accomplish by sharing their data with us. And some especially in into one year, some are very risk averse and some are much more open. Um, and so I think over time, what you're describing is very possible to give you a specific example. Um, we have a, a lot of linked data for LA County across eight different departments that the county built over time. It's not specific to UCLA and we use it for a range of different descriptive analyses and research. Um, there's a broader conversation occurring right now about how the county and its research partnerships would make that more widely available for the purpose of studying homelessness. So it's, it's such an urgent crisis that there's all kinds of different conversations occurring now that maybe wouldn't have five years ago. And so we're trying to think through what that would look like. What's a governance model? How do you manage risk? How do you manage privacy issues? Uh, but this is, a, I think, a really complex topic. Um, we do you know, at the request of a data owner, if, if given very explicit permission, share with different entities. Um, and so it's not necessarily a matter of technical capacity, but what is the legal infrastructure that set up our data sharing in the first place? So uh, hopefully that wasn't too complicated an answer, but I'd be happy to chat afterwards too. Hi, I'm Sonia Tafoya from the Judicial Council of California. My question is sort of related, and for the city of Long Beach, once the data is all married and nicely in the warehouse, um, you can think of that as a public good because it is public government, and taxpayers have a right to know whether their government is serving them or not. So if, if someone were to make like a Public Information Act request or at PAJAR in California, um, if you've been around the government much, um, are, do you, um, can you share that data with external bodies once it's stripped of identifiers? And then this, it's, I guess it's a, it's a three part question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the second part is for um, the Arnold Foundation, is the idea to actually make, is the idea an open data model where eventually all the data will be open, stripped of identifiers so that, you know, you get maximum analysis of the data. And number three, the third thing that occurs to me is now that I'm in government, now I've been back for like a year in this position, there's a lot of people that come into government, young people that are recent grads, like some grads, we have some grads from the Goldman School, and they're really, <laughs> they're really great. And so sometimes in government, um, people can get worn down by just being tired of the workload or tired of the bureaucracy or tired of whatever. And I guess one thing I see sort of the potential for the policy labs is the interaction between academics and um, analysts that work in government and this idea that there could be a back and forth exchange and a mentorship with the academics and some of the 
Like we have a lot of uh, policy master students that would, I think would stay in government longer, would be much more engaged and do a much better job with their work if they had those kind of um, opportunities in, the, in a government job or the opportunity to go back and forth. Um, I, so those are great questions. Some of them are very hard. This is a tough audience. Um, uh, to, to that last one, actually, and then I think the, the first one was actually quite important, but the, to that last one, what I noticed in Chicago, because I was there for four years, is that people, analysts would pass back and forth, actually, between the University of Chicago Urban Labs and, and critical analyst positions at Chicago Public Schools or Chicago Police Department or um, our Department of Family and S Support Services, which I know someone's here from. Um, and so uh, there was a lot of mentorship and cross-training and um, personally speaking, it was by far the most rewarding set of things that I did. And it almost felt like, you know, I'd dive into the crisis of the day, whether it was police misconduct or, you know, a major snowstorm or whatever we were dealing with it. But I got to take a break and hang out at University of Chicago and talk about ideas that I really cared about. So I think what your, your point is really accurate, and I think probably, I can't speak for the other policy labs, but I would imagine that happens. Um, and then Erica, do you wanna take a crack at that or the data questions? Yeah, I yeah. can't answer the question about the, the, the FOIA, oh, the okay. California Sorry. equivalent of the FOIA. But <laughs> so f from a data perspective, um, you know, the, the goal of policy labs, certainly if a government partner has a desire to open up its data and make that data available to the community, we would like policy labs to do everything that they can to facilitate that. One of the limitations that we have seen in the past is um, kind of population level data is incredibly helpful and can provide a picture of, of what's going on when you turn to evaluating specific programs or interventions, oftentimes you do need identified data so you can understand the impact of those those uh, programs on kind of key outcomes. I think opening up identified data to the public is is not going to happen, um, but to the extent that that kind of de-identified data could help governments achieve their, their goals, that's something that we would certainly advocate for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we wrote the administrative regulation, which is on the City of Long Beach website, um, you know, with our other admin regs. We wrote it in such a way that we can share, um, we cannot share, so if we got a PRA, we will not be able to share name, date of birth, and, you know, obviously that confidential information. But yes, we will be sharing once we get the data um, are up and running and, you know, things start moving, we absolutely want to share the results of that, right? Because we're using a combination of taxpayer dollars and foundation funding to do this proof of concept. I mean, fingers crossed that it works. I feel good about it, but we have to be authentic. And I was grateful for the speakers this morning because even if we fail, we have to learn from that and we have to fine tune. And the way we actually wrote the proof of concept and the RCT, that it's an iterative process. Like throughout the process, where we, the team, are working with these researchers to refine, well, um, this isn't working and this is why, okay, let's refine it, let's refine it. We even built in a feasibility study before the RCT starts because we want to make sure that we're refining along the way so that we are getting to the results that we hope for. Um, that's one part. I think in terms of the mentorship, so uh, my one of my colleagues, the director of of economic development, he and I have been talking about how we can engage the universities, um, in, you know, in these university partnerships, where the researchers can use the city of Long Beach as a laboratory to, to, you know, to work on these different projects, whether it be engineering, mathematics, you know, criminal justice. We have it all in that city lab, if you will, and vice versa. That we subject matter ep experts can work closely with the university to help inform their work in academia, and em academia can inform, you know, what we're doing. So we're a that's very open to that model of having this open communication and open learning process. I think we have time for one or two more. Um, sorry, hi, oh, Emily putnam -Hornstein. I just wanted to jump in quickly on the FOIA request thing. So I believe that it may vary a bit across states, but my understanding is that in most states, data that's hosted uh, at universities in a research environment is not subject to FOIA request. And I actually think that that's important um, because we do want to keep in mind that there is a, a kind of a, an ultimate source agency owner for these records and while they're being pulled together for all sorts of hopefully good purposes, um, any FOIA request would go directly to the, the data owners themselves and that's one thing that I think university environments do um, provide a bit when it comes to all the linked data. 
I think we have time for one more. Generally speaking, uh, a lot of people think that um, stripping things of personally identifiable information just means taking off the name and the date of birth. That's not actually true. You can usually figure out who someone is by sort of like the neighborhood that they live in and what age range they are and you know what their educational background is or something. So when we talk about sort of like allowing access to non-personally identifiable data, generally speaking, I think it has to be aggregated, at least for the government, for the state government, it has to be aggregated mm -hmm. to such an extent that there's no fewer than, you know, like a, a certain number of, of people in that same category. And so that to me is a really, really important restriction and protection for this sort of thing because, you know, there's all sorts of privacy implications of, of things. That's a really important point and anyone who works with UI or wage data will be familiar with that requirement. Hi, this is a quick one. Tracy Scott from Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. Uh, Tracy, it's a great name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this question is for you and uh, building on the same data theme. Uh, data is power uh, in organizations and so I commend you for getting all of the different city departments to to share and dump everything into one data warehouse. My question is, um, who owns the data from a governance standpoint in the city government now that they've dumped everything into the data warehouse? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, as one single legal entity, I mean, the city obviously owns the data, the, the data mart, and this project is housed in the city manager's office, you know, which is our, um, you know, place of local control, if you will. And it's our technology and innovation department that actually is, our data scientists is creating the technology, you know, in coordination with them. So hopefully that answers your question. You know, I do want to add, if you don't mind, the, the process, what you saw on this slideshow took a year to get approval to share publicly, right? So when I finally got the approval to go to city council, you know, this, we went through many iterative processes with the police department. Um, we didn't release any data publicly until they gave us their blessing. The city manager gave us his blessing and then Mayor Garcia gave us his blessing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a long process before we were actually able to show all what we learned publicly. And, you know, I believe that's because government and police departments are very tenuous about sharing their information for fear of, you know, maybe backlash or what could come. And so we were careful in that trust building phase to get to this point where now we can start to share our research publicly. And I think that's a, you know, a big lesson that I learned over this last year that it took 12 months um, to build that trust where now the chief is calling and saying, hey, can you help us analyze five years worth of youth violence? data because we want to start to, you know, triage around those individuals and then our adult violent offenders. And they're starting to look at these other layers of how data can inform policy program and budget. Okay. Okay. So please join me in thanking Erica, Tracy, and Jamie. Thank you.